So there are a lot of ways of saying what makes human beings special. We have speech or reason. We are historical beings with culture and tradition. Aristotle tells us that we're the most imitative of animals and we make tools that make tools with which we make tools ad infinitum. We cr make jokes and laugh at them. We create and enjoy art and so on. Last night in seminar during a philippic about lines, a student named another way that humans are special and that is that we're the only animals that stand in lines. Uh, so Pascal points out another peculiarity of human beings. We are the only animals, he says, that admire things. Admiration might be defined as delight in something that is excellent. It's similar to contemplation and that it is or can be a kind of disinterested thought. The capacity to admire is closely connected to the ability to conceive of the good or the beautiful. If we only desired things without a conception of value, we would not be capable of admiration. Therefore, admiration is not a trivial human peculiarity, but is connected to our capacity to transcend desire in disinterested appreciation of excellent things. In his Pensee, Pascal writes much about admiration and related topics, such as glory and envy. He says some extreme things about admiration. For example, he writes that according to the wise, only God should be admired. If this is true, life would become a rather sordid affair. If nothing in earthly life were admirable, nothing valuable, nothing worthy, we, we would be living in a wasteland. And in fact, in many ways, Pascal writes as though we are living in a wasteland. He stresses human vanity, our wretchedness, our need to be distracted in order not to think about ourselves, and, uh, and our own unworthiness of admiration. He, he stresses the depressing limits of our ability to know and our many vices, and in short, what he calls our sinfulness. If you were to point out something that you admired about humans to Pascal, he might well show its seamy underbelly, its hidden vices and vanity, or its roots in sinfulness. Thus, Pascal may fairly be said to have a gloomy, depressing, and cynical view of human nature and human life so that it can be annoying to read him or to think along with him about the human condition, even if many of his criticisms of human beings are at least mostly true. Fortunately, Pascal's pessimism and cynicism do not tell the whole story about him. He describes human beings as greater than all finite things because they can think. He says that human beings are great when they know that they are wretched, he also says that, all human, that although human beings are finite, they are also somehow not quite finite. Since humans are made in the image of God, there is something mysterious about them that makes them transcend mere finitude. There is something fascinating in Pascal's conceptions of humans as things that are greater than all finite beings, but lesser than God. One delightful way that he describes this condition is that he says we are beings who are mysteriously suspended between two infinites. One of the most interesting exceptions to Pascal's negative view of human beings is what he says about people whom he calls universal men. When Pascal contemplates these people, he forgets his wisdom and admires something other than God. I would go so far as to say that his comments about universal men stand out as mysteriously uplifting. How can a thinker who talks so much about human vanity, wretchedness, and sin also be the author of several, several striking aphorisms about universal people? I have provided these aphorisms in a handout. Um, let's read the first one together. And now you can see it. Nobody is publicly accepted as an expert on poetry unless he displays the sign of a poet, mathematician, etc. But universal men want no sign and make hardly any distinction between the crafts of poet and embroiderer. Universal men are not called poets or mathematicians, etc. But they are all these things and judges of them too. 
No one could guess what they are, and they will talk about whatever was being talked about when they came in. One quality is not more noticeable in them than another, unless it becomes necessary to put it into practice, and then we remember it. For it is equally characteristic that they are not described as good speakers, as long as no question of language arises, and that they are when it does. It is therefore false praise to say of someone when he comes in that he is an expert on poetry, and a bad sign if he is not consulted when it is a question of judging some verse. So, I find Pascal's claim that no one could guess what universal men are quite intriguing. I know that there are some obvious, I think that there are some obvious guesses as to what they are, and that some of these obvious guesses are at least partly true. My task is to try to go beyond the obvious and to get a glimpse of what universal human beings are at the deepest level. One way of investigating our first aphorism is to consider what it has to say about intellectual excellence, about the relation of all parts of human skill and knowledge to one another. No doubt this would be a fruitful inquiry. What I, what I am going to do, however, is to consider the moral or spiritual dimension of universal people. Some of us may be suspecting that Pascal's pensee about universal men is self-praise. He is famous for his versatility or for his excellence in many things. Scarcely any human being has been so sublimely versatile as Pascal. He invented a calculating machine. He did pioneering work in probability theory and projective geometry. He contributed to the theory of fluids and, and of gases in his paper on weighing the atmosphere. And of course, he was a profound thinker both about human nature and about theological matters. So we might be tempted to think that in talking about universal men, he is talking about himself, perhaps. But there is a serious objection to this hypothesis. Pa Pascal himself would be deeply ashamed of praising himself and thought deeply, oh, I keep using the same word too much, <laughs> about what he considers to be the evils of self-praise. So for now, let us look for a better explanation. Let us give a charitable interpretation of his aphorism, unless we are forced by the evidence to conclude that in writing of universal men, he was singing a song to his own glory. So one thing that is striking about his description of universal people is that he focuses on how they appear to others and how others think about them. Are universal people concerned about their own appearance? Do they work to manage it? And if so, is that because they are vain or for other reasons? Pascal says that when universal persons join a conversation, they do not change the topic. This could simply be a matter of good manners, but why would good manners be worth mentioning? Or perhaps they do not change the topic of conversation because they are vain and wish to show that they can talk well about anything. But that also doesn't make sense. If they were motivated by vanity, then they would wish others to think that they are good at everything as often as possible. But in fact, Pascal says that people scarcely ever think of the excellence of universal people. So if universal people were vain, they would be very ineffective at impressing other people or at winning praise and admiration. But since they are good at everything, we must conclude that if they wanted to be admired and praised as much as possible, they could succeed at this much better than they in fact do. Therefore, this hypothesis that universal persons are vain does not hold water. I think it's pretty striking that Pascal does not mention that people admire universal men, even though people are aware of the excellence of them. For when one of the excellences of a universal being is needed, other people, says Pascal, remember that excellence and request its use. But he does not say that others are pleased by these excellences. Presumably Pascal, oh, where did I skip something? Um, Pas let's, oh, Pascal, though, says that he himself is pleased by universal men. Um, but he doesn't say that anybody else is. Presumably, Pascal is wiser and more discerning than most people. 
The converse side of their not being admired is that universal people do not seem to be envied. Since other people do not think of the excellence of universal humans, except when they need help, it follows that other people do not envy them, or are pretty unlikely to. How could they envy them when they don't usually remember that there is something to envy? Let us now pause to consider what we already know universal people accomplish. Others are aware of their excellence. Already this might be thought remarkable. Often excellence is not noticed or goes unappreciated. But when other people need excellent help, others remember what universal men have to offer. On the other hand, even though we are aware of the excellence of universal people, we somehow do not notice that excellence most of the time or think about it, with the result that we don't, do not usually either admire or envy it. I think this is, I know I'm stressing this, but I think it's rather remarkable. How do they manage discreetly to show that they're great in such a way that others do not think much about it, admire it, or envy it? In order to reveal themselves to those in need, but hide themselves from envy, it seems to me that universal human beings need superlative art and wisdom. It is a supremely artful accomplishment to be helpfully hidden and helpfully revealed. Art and wisdom, however, are not enough. Given that they work, given that universal people work to avoid being admired and envied, it seemed that they must be profoundly modest or humble. And given that they reveal themselves in such a way that people who need their help can ask for it, universal people must also have goodwill towards other people or benevolence. Thus, universal human beings have supreme art and wisdom, profound modesty or humility, and benevolence. In order to make still more sense of this aphorism, that we've been working on. We need to draw on other uh, ponce on universal men and on Pascal's thought as a whole. Let's see. In the third aphorism on the handout at the end of it, I think, Pascal says that what he needs is an upright man who can accommodate himself generally to all Pascal's needs. The person Pascal needs is universal because he can help with all Pascal's needs. But what is more important here, I think, is that Pascal wants this universal person to be upright. Universal capacity is not enough. Uprightness, righteousness, or goodness is required too. The righteousness of universal people is an important clue for us as we try to guess their mystery. I propose that it is because they are upright or good that they do not want to be admired or envied. That seems obvious. Um, why did I say that? Let us therefore consider a ponce in which Pascal considers a hierarchy of excellences that includes goodness or something like goodness. You'll probably remember this one. I'm not going to read it, but it's one of the more exciting ones, I think, in the book. So he talks about carnal greatness, uh, intellectual greatness, and then I don't think maybe spiritual. He speaks of charity and wisdom. One kind of greatness, says Pascal, is car carnal or worldly. This seems to include good looks, exploits in war, athletic feats, wealth, social influence, political power, and things like that. People who appreciate that kind of greatness often don't appreciate a higher kind of intellectual greatness, uh, intellectual, that is, greatness in science, math, philosophy, or art. Um, a third kind of greatness, which, is, which he says is infinitely above intellectual greatness and which is invisible even to most people who have intellectual excellence, is the greatness of wisdom and charity. So I'm already going to tell you that um, my main point is that um, universal men as described by Pascal do not provoke admiration and envy because they are wise and charitable, because they love their fellow human beings and do not want to tempt them to be envious. That is, the reason that, they, that no one can guess what universal men are is that their charity is usually invisible to merely carnal and intellectual excellence. 
In order to make sense of and develop this hypothesis, we're going to consider several other thoughts of Pascal that have to do with admiration, envy, and charity. Pascal writes that admiration spoils all from infancy, and he connects this claim to the problem of envy. His thinking seems to be that the desire to be admired spoils the ambitious person by making him proud and vain. When Pascal thinks, <coughs> when in fact Pascal thinks, a person should instead be humble and modest. The person, person who is ambitious to be admired also spoils other people by making them envy the accomplishments of the ambitious person when, according to Pascal, they should love him instead. The competition for admiration between ambitious people also causes ill will and strife when instead, Pascal thinks, there should be goodwill and cooperation. In another Ponce, Pascal says that the propensity to self is the beginning of all disorder in war, in economy, and in the particular body of man. I don't know what he means by that. That is, selfishness or egoism is the root of most human problems. In order to solve or avoid these problems, Pascal thinks that we must consider the common good. The person who is ambitious for admiration, however, thinks little about the common good, but about his own good and his propensity to self harms the common good and causes disorder. Pascal claims that the proud or vain desire for glory is based on an intellectual error. He asserts that we love people for borrowed qualities. Presumably he would say that we admire people, that we admire people for their borrowed qualities. But what does he mean by this and what does he mean by borrowed qualities? One might say that people work for many, <coughs> that they work and strive to develop their admirable qualities and therefore rightfully own them. Pascal disagrees. I think he would say that every admirable quality you have acquired is based on abilities that you were given and that could be taken away from you at any time. You do not own these abilities, but were lent them. Therefore, anything that you acquire from them is also the result of a loan or of a borrowing. Of course, some admirable qualities do really partly result from hard work, but even hard work is not totally the property of the hard worker. He or she works hard because of desires, help, and encouragement that were given to him or her. Given that our admirable qualities are borrowed, Pascal thinks that it does not make sense to be proud of them or vain about them. Um, I'm just going to add that I don't know where to put this, but I, I, I was really struck years ago when I first read Rousseau saying that nothing is stupider, or stupider to be proud of than that one is intelligent. So I think he must have the same thing in mind that you don't make, a person doesn't make oneself intelligent and there's no reason to be proud of it. Um, where am I? Given that our admirable qualities are borrowed, Pascal thinks that it does not make sense to be proud of them. I said that. Instead, he thinks it makes better sense to be grateful for them and, and to feel responsible to use them well for the benefit of other people who may not have been given as much. Maybe not always, but very often, the person who was proud or vain about his excellence is greedy. When he is given one blessing, he is greedy for another. He has already been blessed with the gift of excellent abilities, but he wants more. He wants to be blessed also with the glory for his excellence. Pascal thinks that, there, that it is more reasonable for the excellent person to feel that because he has been given much, he owes it to other people to use his abilities in order to benefit, benefit them. So have you ever felt have you ever had a friend who failed in some case where you succeeded so that you felt delicate about this or even embarrassed by your success and were afraid of hurting your friend? Pascal seems to think that this is how you should feel about your admirable qualities. You should be worried about hurting other people with them, causing them sorrow over their own failure and envy for your success. 
That is why a person should often take measures, Pascal thinks, to conceal his or her success when there is no need for them to be known, for it to be known. Not surprisingly, Pascal thinks that seeking glory is base and that a person who is righteous does not seek applause. He also claims that noble deeds are best when they are hidden. In fact, he, I think there's this pensee where he's pretty extreme and says they really need to be thoroughly hit, hidden. But then a, a difficulty arises because we understand by now why, according to Pascal, noble deeds should be both hidden and revealed. Um, sometimes maybe a noble deed can set a good example or it could make people aware that certain kinds of help are available. So in that Pascal, in that Ponce, I think Pascal is a little inaccurate. Um, I think what he really means is that noble deeds should be hidden at the right time from the right people and revealed at the right time to the right people. Um, so what he says about universal men in the aphorism that I read is more accurate, uh, but also more sly and slippery. I think Pascal is profound about the subtle dialectic of revealing and concealing when he talks about Christ. He says that Christ admittedly had renown, but, Pascal claims, Christ had no renown for himself. All of his renown was for humanity, so that people might recognize him for what he was. Therefore, having renown, glory, or admiration can be useful if one, one wants to help other people. Yeah, I've stressed that. There is a saying of Christ that points to a way that revealing admirable qualities can help other people. Um, it's from the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. The idea here is that one should reveal one's light, that is, one's spiritual or moral virtues, but only in such a way as to direct people's attention to God. This seems to be a very difficult thing to do and to requ require great finesse. Perhaps this art is similar to that with which universal human beings manage to show their excellences, but not to be admired or envied. Pascal claims that the true good should be such as all people can possess at once, without diminution and without envy. In other words, the true good is a common good. It is perfectly shareable in its own nature and owing to the way that it invites people to respond to it. Let's apply this idea of the true, <clears throat> true good to universal men. They help to bring about a good which is not quite the true good, but which resembles it. That is, they have the good of excellent understanding and they share this good with others as much as possible. They put their excellent understanding wholly at the service of others and do not provoke envy. Thus, their individual excellences belong as much as possible to a community of people who are talking with one another. Other people do not notice the individual excellence of the universal person with whom they are talking when they don't need to. But when they do need to, they remember, ask for the use of that, qual that virtue, and they benefit from it. I imagine that when the group is helped by the universal person, it doesn't feel indebted, but instead feels a kind of group ownership of what the group is learning. Admittedly, the good achieved by this community of thinkers is not the true good, as I said. The less gifted people in the community will not understand what the universal person says as well as he or she does. Nevertheless, this community is an image of the true good because they share something <clears throat> in a deep way without envy and with a sense of community. Pascal describes Christian life as being a member or a part that does not have a life or being of its own, but only in the body or community of which it is a part. I think that this is how universal people see themselves. 
<coughs> and they help other people to see them and themselves in this way too. Universal people think that their excellences live in and belong to a community. And they help other people to think and feel the same way. Therefore, the true greatness of universal people, according to Pascal, is not their nearly superhuman intellectual versatility, but what they do to create a community of learners. They are universal not primarily because they know so much, but because they build a whole, a community that can involve everyone present who wants to be a part of it. Pascal claims that the sole aim of scripture is charity. Everything in scripture, he says, which does not seem to be about charity, which is most of it, is a type of it, that is, a symbol of it. What he means by charity is loving one's neighbor as oneself. But why, you may ask, does the Bible, according to Pascal, talk about charity indirectly when it could be clearer by talking about it directly. Pascal answers that God varies the sole precept of charity to satisfy our curiosity, which seeks, <clears throat> which seeks variety. We would grow bored with constant talk about charity. Therefore, the Bible prevents our boredom and piques our interest by presenting symbols of charity that are not obvious. I suggest that Pascal himself imitates the Bible by presenting universal people as types, figures, or symbols of charity. It takes some sleuthing to figure out that universal people are types of charity, <clears throat> and this need for sleuthing makes universal people interesting. What is more, Pascal hints that detective work is needed, is needed by saying that no one guesses what univer universal people are. That is, he presents us with an intriguing riddle and with the prospect of an interesting investigation. Let me say more clearly why universal people are images of charity. According to traditional Christian theology, probably classical philosophy too, or roughly, didn't talk about charity. According to Christian theology, envy is the opposite of charity. While charity on the one hand desires, works for, and rejoices in the good of the neighbor, envy on the other hand is pained by the good of the neighbor and therefore neither desires nor works for the good of the neighbor. So we can see that charity and envy have the same object as their point of, point of focus, namely, good things for others. But charity is happy about the neighbor's good, and envy is sad about it. Now, as we have seen, universal people avoid being envied because they conceal their excellence in a way that prevents people from thinking about it except when there is a need for it. Moreover, they use their gifts in the service of others and almost make their talents the common property of a group of talkers or thinkers. That is, they use their talents for the community without calling much attention to themselves so that we might say that they're loving their neighbors as themselves and at least partly make this known. Let us return to Pascal's claim in the first aphorism, that universal men do not want a sign, that is, do not want to be labeled as a poet or a mathematician and therefore hide their mathematical greatness and other kinds. I think that's in the, <clears throat> I think this is also in the second one on the handout, that they don't want to be labeled or have a sign. Okay, where am I? So some people don't want a sign or do not want to be labeled for the sake of individualistic freedom. A sign or a label might restrict their freedom to do or to be what they want and therefore they don't want to be labeled. Other people who are good at many things do not want to be labeled as excellent at one thing because they want to be admired not for that one thing but for many things. 
Universal people have a deeper and nobler reason for not wanting to be labeled. Pascal gives us a clue about their deeper reason when he claims that we never love a person but only qualities. That's a striking claim. So he says we don't love people but only qualities. I think what he means is that the person behind the qualities is hard or maybe impossible to discern, that it's much harder, uh, yeah, I'll say that. Um, so someone is attractive or witty or charming or intelligent, and we notice these things and sometimes love that person for their quality or qualities or just love the qualities. But I suggest Pascal thinks that loving qualities is not charity or real love. Charity instead loves a person. I suggest that a universal person hides his or her qualities in order to relate to other people as a person and not as a cluster of qualities. Universal people make it possible for other people to love them as persons and not as qualities by denying ownership of their qualities or by making it clear that they regard their virtues as loans. What then is a person if not a collection of qualities. And the first thing I should say is, I don't know really what Pascal thinks for sure, but I'm gonna make a guess. Uh, my guess is that Pascal thinks a person is a locus of love, is someone who loves or does not love. A person is a member or a potential member of a human community united by charity so that one shows oneself to be a person and helps others to be persons through charitable union with them. Thus, universal people do not want a sign because they want to be a part of a community in which people relate to one another as persons and not as constellations of characteristics. I think most people would find Pascal's vision of universal people and the communities that they help create to be beautiful and attractive. But, we should ask, is it possible to achieve this vision or even to approximate it? Also, we should ask whether it would be healthy or beneficial to try to achieve it. Perhaps human beings are fundamentally selfish, or at least so selfish that it is not possible to approximate Pascal's vision. What is worse, perhaps attempting to approximate this vision would put an unbearable strain on human nature so that selfishness will become more devious and show itself in unhealthy ways that we could have avoided by a frank admission that we are fundamentally selfish beings. Often, perfectionism leads to worse results than modest ambition. And perhaps Pascal's perfectionism about universal people is a case of this kind. One might also argue that Pascal is wrong to stop people or discourage them from trying to be admired. The ambition to be admired and competing with other people for glory produces excellence. If we stop seeking admiration, then we may well stop being admirable. More generally, if we try to destroy selfishness and make all important things common property, we may make people neglectful of the common good or even apathetic about it. For if we naturally in, and inevitably love what is privately our own much more than common property, then we are fighting against human nature when we seek to minimize the importance of private goods for the sake of a grand common good. Perhaps we should also suspect that the desire to stop ad admiring other people and to share the excellence of universal people as if they, are <clears throat> they were... Um, let me make that. Anyway, we could, we could suspect that the desire to s uh, stop admiring is rooted in a kind of weakness. Maybe we want excellent people to hide their excellence because we envy them. Maybe we want excellent people to hide their excellence because we're lazy and don't want to strive and compete with them. Or perhaps the idea of community is soothing because we are afraid to stand alone as single individuals. That is, maybe we sink to the level of herd animals because we are afraid to be genuine individuals. 
What then might Pascal say about all these suspicions and objections? First, he would admit that they have much weight or validity. In fact, since he is such a negative fellow himself, he would insist on the weight of the objections we just considered, for he is more aware than we are <clears throat> of how selfish, cowardly, and lazy human beings can be. He is aware of our tendency to be herd animals. He is aware that without ambition for admiration, people tend to become mediocre. <clears throat> he says of a certain community of believers that he knew well, that their children, who were strictly taught not to seek to be admired, did not achieve any excellence. Most generally, he thinks deeply about what we would call human sinfulness, which encompasses all of the problems we just considered and more. But, he might add, it is important that we are deeply moved, if we are, by the vision of community created by universal human beings. The fact that many of us are profoundly inspired by this vision would reveal that the vision shows us something about what is deepest and most important in human nature. If we were merely selfish beings, then the vision would seem like mere nonsense and folly to us, not like an admirable fantasy. It's striking, I think, <clears throat> that, um, that many thinkers who aren't Christians seem at least partly to agree with Pascal about this vision. <clears throat> so we can start with Marx. The seniors are reading Marx right now. <clears throat> Marx dreamed of a future community of humanity in which there was little selfishness. He thought this kind of community was possible because he believed that human beings are selfish, not by nature, but because of social conditions. Therefore, if we can revolutionize our social conditions in the right way, we will almost automatically shed the objectionable aspects of our selfishness. Is there anybody here who knows Nietzsche well? I'm not sure of this, but I am going to say, Nietzsche criticizes ignoble people because they typically resent noble people for their excellence. He thinks that in some cases at least, however, it is possible not to resent people who are more excellent than oneself. Perhaps this can happen through individual effort of people who are not great. Maybe it comes about, alternatively, owing to the work of supermen who create a new kind of humanity that is centered on and supports the excellence of a few great people. If so, surprisingly, there is something in this vision that is similar to Pascal's, in that Nietzsche imagines a community <clears throat> led by excellence, but in which there's little envy. So if even Nietzsche agrees with, in part with Pascal about such a community, then perhaps we are overly cynical in our doubts and suspicions about it. Rousseau often praises the Spartans for their virtue and for their collectivist way of life. He claims that the joys of their patriotism were 100 times more intense than the joys of romantic love. This is to say that I want to be a Spartan. <laughs> this is to say that their joy in a common good was much greater than one of the most intensely pleasurable private human goods. Okay, maybe Rousseau is exaggerating. Maybe he's telling a noble lie. For my purposes, that wouldn't matter. What would matter is that he thought it worth well to tell the lie. He thinks it is healthy and beneficial to have an ideal of a common good. A common good that is not thin, but substantial. A common good that is the most important thing in our lives. A common good that we care about more than almost any of our private goods. Or maybe if he doesn't exactly want us to strive for this ideal because we can't recover it any longer, at least he wants us to admire it, to keep it in mind and to apply it as much as we can to our life collectively and privately. 
Plutarch tells a story about a Spartan who wished to be selected as one of the 300 who were to fight at Thermopylae during the Persian War. When he was not selected, that guy rejoiced that there were 300 men who were deemed to be more worthy than he was in Sparta. That's how, Pat, that's how Plutarch tells the story, and it's a beautiful one. Does that seem strained or exaggerated to you? I think, in a way, we're like that man. Um, would you be happy if Shakespeare never existed so that your writing could be closer to being the best? Would you be content to remain as you are but have all excellence higher than yours erased from human history? I doubt it. I think most of us are happy that there are people more excellent than we are. But, of course, there are some people that we're not so happy to learn are more excellent than we are. So we've come at the problem of envy from one side, from the side of the excellent person. Uh, and we've seen that Pascal suggests that to work on that problem, excellent people should hide and not reveal their excellence. But we could also come at this problem from the other side, from the side of the envier. Um, to put my point simply, we could try to admire more and envy less. We, we could try to rejoice in the excellence of others instead of being pained by it. Um, it's also possible as you admire excellent people to imitate them, to emulate them, even to seek to surpass them. And then if one fails to surpass them, one can be like that Spartan man who rejoiced to know that there were 300 other Spartans more worthy than he. So now I'm going to praise us. I would like to, I'm almost concluding. It's going to seem like I'm concluding a few times. The lecture is not long, but um, don't start walking out or standing up or anything until you see me move. So I'm claiming I would like to conclude with an example of an admirable community that we often experience here at St. John's College, namely our classes. Of course, there is some competition and envy and ill will among us, but I think these problems are not the norm. Often, we achieve a sense of a common good that we are building together in conversation. We are building an interpretation together, or we build an understanding of problems, questions, possible answers, and possible solutions. As we delight in the conversation, we focus on our shared inquiry and sometimes do not think too much about impressing other people. How is this possible? How does it happen? One reason that it's possible is that intellectual goods can be shared. We can all understand the same thing. A thing is not diminished because we all understand it. A, Eucl a Euclidean proposition is important largely because it can be shared by all of us, because it is a demonstration of a beautiful truth, universally um, shareable or accessible through reason. Of course, it often happens that one person understands something better than others, but even in these cases, there is a common core of shared understanding. Often in class, our delight in what we understand is enhanced precisely because we share our understanding with others. We are social and rational beings so that we can enjoy creating a society of shared understanding. In Plato's Republic, Socrates argues or posits that the glory, desire for glory is not the deepest human desire. Deeper than this desire, he says, is the desire for truth. If so, that helps to explain why in seminar we can subordinate our desire for admiration to our desire for understanding or for knowledge. Socrates also professed to be someone who was happier to be refuted than to teach others because when he was refuted, he learned something. If it is possible to be, to be happily refuted, that is because the good of learning some things is greater than the glory of winning a debate. 
Chaucer sums up the dialogical attitude of Socrates, though he's not talking about Socrates. He does that with admirable simplicity when he says the following of the clerk in the general prologue to his Canterbury Tales. So what he says is, gladly would he te learn and gladly teach. Gladly would he learn and gladly teach. These simple but beautiful words aptly describe the spirit that we hope mostly will animate our classes here at St. John's. Of course, it takes some work to create or become a part of this spirit, but the work is well worth it. Um, I'm gonna recapitulate some things here. So when Pascal writes about universal people, he indicates that what is most important about them is hidden. I have argued that the deepest secret about them is their charity, wisdom, and art. They artfully conceal their excellence in order not to tempt other people to envy them and in order not to cause ill-willed competition. But they also somehow manage to reveal their excellence so that when there is need of it, other people may ask for help and receive it without resentment. Universal people must be righteous in order not to want to make a grand display of their greatness. And they need, let's see, I'm gonna skip that. Um, and oh, I guess I should say that they, they need benevolence also in order to want to share and do good to others. So the community that, the, that universal people build may be based on the common good of shared understanding of a truth or of a text. Or it may, may be founded on shared admiration of a poem or an opera. Understanding and admiration are excellent candidates for a common good because there is scarcely any limit in their capacity to be shared. In fact, understanding and admiration are even enhanced by being shared. In the process of shared inquiry, Pascal thinks that an even greater good than shared understanding can be promoted, namely true humanity. True humanity comes to be when people see one another not merely as collections of qualities, but as persons who thrive in charitable community. So um, we could ask now why Pascal doesn't explicitly explain the meaning of universal men, and I'm assuming I'm correct here about what they are. Here at St. John's, we're all familiar with one good answer. We understand something better and care more about it if we discover it for ourselves or participate in its discovery. By writing suggestively and inviting us to participate in inquiring about universal people, Pascal creates a community with us that spans many centuries. I think there's one other important reason that Pascal writes about universal people as he does. Um, so we know that he says that charity is the only real subject in the scriptures, and that when the subject of a biblical passage doesn't seem to be charity, the passage is talking about charity indirectly or through symbols. You will remember that one purpose of this indirection is to avoid tedium by talking of, um, by way of enjoyable variety. Scripture makes concessions to our weakness by talking about the most important thing in a variety of ways so that we can understand and appreciate it better. I think Pascal imitates this by talking about charity in a hidden, interesting, and surprising way. So I told you earlier that Pascal says that wise people don't delight in anything but God. But he also says that he himself is pleased with universal human beings. Thus, universal human beings are an exception to Pascal's almost unremitting negativity about us and our world. Perhaps he makes this exception because universal human beings resemble God through their charity. But it seems to me that he also delights healthily in the intellectual versatility and the pedagogical art of universal human beings. So I think Pascal certainly is foolish enough to delight in many things besides God. 
And this really is the last paragraph. Um, I think I may have given the false impression that only universal people can artfully hide and artfully reveal their excellence in order to promote a community of learning. Um, but in fact, anyone who, who wants to can do this, at least sometimes and to some degree. Whenever and wherever shared inquiry thrives, the participants in these inquiries are choosing to cooperate rather than to compete. They are choosing not to relate by way of admiration and envy, but by way of something like goodwill, benevolence, or charity. Thank you.